afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to start by congratulating Ryan Cochran Siegel, winning the silver last night on the Super G, 50 years after his mother took home gold. Vermonters are very proud of what he's accomplished. And as I was watching last night, I also noticed he was wearing bib number 14, which I think has some symbolism as Vermont was the 14th state to join the union. I also know it's a great number to have for all kinds of racing, regardless of what it is. But again, I want to uh, congratulate Ryan and the entire family and uh, thank them, the whole family, for continuing to inspire us. Moving on to the COVID front, things continue to move in the right direction, so I don't have much to add. So in addition to our usual lineup, I'm joined by Commissioner Tierney, uh, as we'll be discussing our $51 million proposal to expand wireless service across the state. Over the past several years, expanding broadband, rightfully, has gotten a lot of attention. And we put forward plans to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to build out service and connect um, more homes to what is considered an economic necessity in the 21st century. Fortunately, the legislature has worked with us on these plans and we're making significant progress with the help of Director Halquist and the VCB. Even though broadband has received a lot of attention, anybody like me who's driven around the state a lot can tell you it's time we bring Vermont to the, into the 21st century with cell service as well. In the year 2022, when almost everyone has a phone in their pocket and fewer having had, have uh, landlines, Cell coverage is a necessity and it's an area where we need to do much, much better. I proposed a plan two weeks ago in my budget address that invests over 50 million in ARPA capital funds to build more towers and significantly expand service. The benefits of this are obvious, from economic development to public safety. As we seek to grow stronger, more vibrant communities and attract people, not just to Chittenden County, but all parts of our state, we need to have access to cell service. It's not a luxury, it's an expectation. And not just by Vermonters, but also tourists who are critical to our economy. And from a public safety perspective, the need for more coverage just makes sense. If you're in an accident or come on to one, you should be able to reach someone, no matter where you are. The bottom line is, if you're in need of a first responder at your home or on the road, lack of cell service shouldn't be what prevents you from getting the help you need. For almost a year, ever since the American Rescue Plan passed, I've talked about the need for using one-time federal money for transformative, tangible initiatives. This plan does exactly that, and it's the type of project that will be very difficult to fund in the future if we don't take advantage of this opportunity today. Just like with broadband, expanding cell service to the extent we're talking about will require public investment. This plan is currently in the hands of the legislature, and if you agree reliable cell service across the state is critical, I encourage you to reach out and ask them to make it a priority. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Tierney, who will go into further detail. Commissioner. Good afternoon. I'm here today to talk about Vermont's need for expanded cell service and Governor Scott's plan to address that need by spending over $50 million of federal capital project dollars to deploy 100 new cell towers in Vermont. Now the need to materially improve cell service in Vermont is obvious to many who live, work, and travel in our state. Expanded mobile wireless is critical for public safety, transportation, education, and the economy. This is a truth that stings when we find ourselves in a place with no cell signal and we face the repercussions from missing or dropping an important call. It's happened to all of us. Fundamentally, the need to act on cell service in Vermont is about equity as well. 
too many of us, and particularly in rural parts, do not have reliable cell service to get help, to work, to learn, to check in with doctors, nurses, caseworkers, and to be in touch with our loved ones. In short, many people in Vermont do not have cell service that allows them to prosper, as fellow Vermonters do in our population centers, where cell service is better because the customer base is bigger and more profitable. Our cell service suffers from market gaps, just like broadband. Now, in 2018, the Public Service Department, which is the agency I lead, did a drive test of all federal aid recipients, that is to say, highways that receive federal aid, in Vermont. And here is some of what we found. 62% of roadways have marginal cell service. 10% of Vermont roadways lack a signal from any carrier at all. About 70% of tested road miles have a signal either from AT&T or Verizon. And that's why so many of us are carrying around two phones, if you can afford it, just to have reliable coverage wherever we go. Here's what the governor's proposing. We would establish and fund a critical communications infrastructure program to be carried out by the Department of Public Service in partnership with the Agency of Transportation, the Department of Public Safety, our regional planning commissions, the Agency for Commerce and Community Development, and most importantly, in a manner that respects the will of our communities. Now here are the two core objectives of the Critical Communications Infrastructure Program. The first is to ensure there is uniform voice coverage along targeted corridors in Vermont from one or more of the three nationwide carriers. And the second is to improve mobile wireless data services, internet on the go, if you will. This will help with public safety, health, education, and commerce. Here's what the Critical Communications Infrastructure Program will do. The state of Vermont will facilitate building 100 new cell towers. The towers will be deployed in rural areas to reach unserved roads and improve coverage in population centers presently underserved by cell service. Priority coverage areas will be identified by experts under contract with the department using fresh cell coverage data collected through a new drive test that updates the extensive testing the department did in 2018. That project is underway as we speak. Now here's the funding for the Critical Communications Infrastructure Program. Governor Scott proposes to use $51 million in federal monies from the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund. This is a discrete pot of money that was established by the U.S. Treasury, set aside specifically to address the severe infrastructure challenges laid bare by the pandemic, especially in rural America, in tribal communities, and low and moderate income communities. The Capital Projects Fund aims to help ensure that all communities have access to critical inf services via high quality modern infrastructure, such as broadband and other forms of digital connectivity. As you may know, the American Rescue Plan provides $10 billion nationally to carry out critical capital projects that strengthen and improve the infrastructure we need to participate in work, education, and health monitoring, infrastructure that will last and that will pay dividends beyond the pandemic. Now, Vermont's share of the capital, funds pro of the capital projects fund is approximately $100 million. Now, here are the five steps of the Critical Communications Infrastructure Plan. The first is to identify priority road corridors via drive testing and traffic and population analysis. The second is to identify suitable tower sites locations to serve these priority areas. The third step is to conduct a request for proposal process to confirm carrier interest in using the towers to expand their service and identify co-location rent rates. The fourth step is to grant funds to cell service providers to hang their gear on these towers. And the fifth step is to conduct an RFP process to deploy towers at the identified locations. Now I want to emphasize that this program will have a robust community engagement process for identifying tower sites. We will partner with communities, their leadership, their regional, uh, regional planning commissions, and public safety organizations. We will seek public input where folks have opportunity to voice concerns and provide real world information about what they need and want. For instance, you've heard it said, there's a gap on Route 12 where I always lose my calls, or 
don't put that tower right there. It's going to have a material impact on a favored community picnic spot. All of this will be part of the corridor targeting and search ring analysis that the department will perform with its experts. And this will happen well before tower sites are selected, well before any processes for permitting. So there will be ample advanced public notice and input. This approach makes respect for the will of the community the North Star of our planning process. There are several touch points of the critical communications infrastructure program in the life of our state. To name just a few, as you heard the governor say a moment ago, public safety, health and human services, education, the economy, workforce development, tourism, and transportation. Let's talk about public safety. Most E911 calls are from mobile wireless. Now, too many people lack access to wireless coverage, so they can't call from home. A significant portion of road miles lack access, so they can't make calls from rural roadsides. 75% of calls to 911 in 2021 in Vermont were from mobile wireless, which is up, in, uh, up from 71% in 2020, forgive me. 14% of calls to 911 are abandoned, likely because these were wireless calls that were dropped. Let's talk about health and human services and how it's touched by this program. People need reliable and ready access to their doctors, nurses, and other health care providers. Cell service is the tool they need to be in touch. Social workers need to reach their clients as they travel the state to check on their health and welfare. When time is short for someone, especially someone who's vulnerable, crucial help can be delayed or come too late when there's no reliable cell service. Education. Vermont students are more technology aware than ever before. Software and website developers are producing applications specifically for the classroom. Wireless networks are used for real-time data collection and assessment. Wireless networks allow for vast learning opportunities in remote areas. Wireless enables remote learning, which can reduce dependency on transportation systems. And then the economy. Attracting workforce and business development Nearly every industry, from the self-employed to corporate executives, rely on a cell phone to connect with clients and customers. We need to attract workers and business development. We also need to keep our youth. They are tomorrow's workers and tomorrow's business developers. Tourism. Cell phones are critical to make reservations, find accommodations, check transportation options, and loco locate attractions. Visitors expect connectivity. Tourists enjoy sharing their Vermont experience in real time with family and friends. Think text, think pictures. 100% of people polled between 18 to 29 have a cell phone. For most of them, they can only be reached by cell phone. 98% of US college graduates rely on their cell phone. Finally, transportation. Wireless communications are critical for current and future transportation needs. We have a convergence underway between fiber, wireless, the electric grid. It's all becoming a seamless unified network. We need to support that with adequate cell service. Intelligent highway management, snow plow and emergency vehicle tracking needs cell service. Reporting on real time highway conditions, absolutely critical. Crowdsourcing and smart navigation, also very important. Automization and modernization in transportation, our fleet management and our distribution tracking depend on having good cell service. With that, Governor, that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take questions or pass it back to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, momentarily, I'll give an update on our COVID-19, our usual COVID-19 topics, but before that, the pandemic has exposed some gaps in our care system. Last week, we talked about the stressors on mental health. This week, I wanna focus on an area that went well during the pandemic, helping to make mental health and other care and services more available to Vermonters. During the pandemic, a lot of health care was delivered remotely, and many people were able to apply for services in new ways. These changes have increased access, oops, These services have increased access to some of our most vulnerable Vermonters, but it hasn't been usual, universally felt by everyone. 
One of the gaps that it's exposed is the lack of universal, high-quality, reliable wireless and cellular service. It, while most Vermonters find that these are important components, it's particularly important for Vermonters who have immediate or high-risk health conditions, are in, uh, are in need of benefits or in need of services, live in rural areas and are more, on, are more isolated than others, and lack access to transportation. Adequate wireless and cellular service means more Vermonters can connect with healthcare providers without leaving their home, access telehealth and telemedicine mental health services, can consult with specialty providers located out of state but who have license in Vermont, which allows us to expand significantly our healthcare workforce, connect or access case managers and home visiting providers between visits, access life-saving services such as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the, and the Crisis Text Line. And for those who are blind and, and visually impaired, cell phones help them to navigate their communities, assist with object recognition, and text-to-speech assistance. Connectivity also increases the availabilities of Vermonters to apply for benefits. For many people across Vermont, online applications have become the norm. It also helps to mitigate health disparities caused by the lack of reliable transportation. For Vermonters who have stayed home because they are high risk for the negative health impacts of COVID during the pandemic, cellular service gives them tools to help reduce isolation, which has been a key factor for improving and maintaining mental health. Cellular service is also critical for our AHS staff and for service providers. It allows them to connect with clients no matter where either party is, giving them more flexibility. It reduces the number of times that staff show up for a home visit only to find out that the client's not available. And like many, um, many Vermonters, AHS and other service providers are often on the road between clients' homes and district offices. It can put them in precarious situations. Cell service allows them to connect when they have an emergency. We look forward to a time when all Vermonters have universal reliable cell service to support equitable access to benefits and services. The governor's proposal to improve cell service and wireless access in Vermont is key for health and human services clients and staff. Now, speaking of the systems of care and COVID, we continue to monitor our hospitals closely. The number of ICU beds and the bed availability across the state has been stable, and we are seeing less staff who are absent from work due to COVID. So many Vermonters did their part and got a vaccine during the pandemic, which is likely a key factor in why our hospitals, which did experience serious stress, did better than many other hospitals across the country. So many Vermonters did their, <clears throat> throughout the pandemic, We've seen continuous access to hospital and emergency services um, for urgent needs. Sometimes that's been difficult to access in other states. As of today, 58% of Vermonters 12 and older are up to date on their vaccines. Thank you to Vermonters for staying up to date. Staying up to date in vaccines protects our healthcare system and continues us on a pass forward with COVID. That said, we recognize that it can be hard to plan in a time to get an additional COVID vaccine. We wanna make it easy and accessible for any Vermonter to be vaccinated, regardless of whether it's their first shot or their third shot. So for Vermonters, you can make an appointment for a vaccine or a booster by going online to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or calling 855-722-7878. If you're a community organization or an employer or another group, please reach out. We'll come to you so that you can host a clinic to make it easier for the people that you serve. To make a request for a clinic, you can go to healthvermont.gov business. Thank you for today, and I'll turn it over to Secretary French for an educational update.
Uh, thank you, Secretary Samuel, Samuelson. Good afternoon. I have just a brief update today about our schools. Uh, with our high vaccination rates and with Omicron receding, our schools have reached more stability in their operations. It is important that we continue to make progress with vaccination, however, uh, so I continue to encourage parents to get their children vaccinated and to get their boosters when they're eligible. We are reaching stability in both the supply and demand for antigen tests uh, relative to our test at home program. Our supply remains very strong. So this week uh, we announced uh, the expansion of test at home uh, to include independent schools. They are able to order those uh, tests as we speak. Another testing program we're working on is what we're calling an assurance testing pro program for school staff. When we announced we were ending regular PCR surveillance testing in schools, we heard from a number of school staff that they would welcome the opportunity to have some sort of regular testing present in schools. The testing program we're designing for school staff will include two antigen tests per staff member per week um, to provide them some assurance about their status relative to the virus. These additional test kits will be delivered to school districts uh, for this purpose and participation in the program from the perspective of the school staff, school staff is entirely voluntarily, voluntary and we hope to launch the program very soon. We'll have more news on that shortly. Uh, that concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichet. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary French, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as the governor alluded to, the COVID-19 trends in Vermont have continued to improve as the Omicron wave subsides from our state and our region and the country as a whole. Uh, in Vermont, we're reporting on the seven-day average under 400 cases. We haven't reported under 400 cases since the mid part of December. So that really puts us back to the pre-Omicron level uh, in terms of the case counts that we're seeing. We're down 41% this week and down 79% since the peak uh, in the middle of January. So on the case front, things are improving and um, expected to continue to improve. Testing has been down 30% uh, this week, 54% since the peak. Uh, so case decreases are outpacing the decrease we're seeing in testing. As we uh, have mentioned previously, as there are fewer cases, there may be less demand and need for tests, less exposures. Also, of course, we know that people are doing at-home tests as well that we may not be picking up. But all of those things factor into uh, a declining positivity rate and um, some confidence that we are seeing uh, the decline uh, in cases across Vermont and the, the region, and those declines are real. Uh, we're also seeing a decrease for the first week in long-term care facility outbreaks, uh, and also college campuses uh, are seeing their cases go down as well. On the next slide, you'll see that these uh, improvements are not limited to Vermont, uh, but in fact, the map is now pretty much green almost everywhere, just indicating that cases are on the decline. This is not the prevalence of cases, but the decrease in cases that we're seeing, uh, increasing or decreasing pretty much and improving across much of the country, down about 46% nationwide, down 39% uh, in New England. And again, both the country and New England getting back to pre-Omicron levels. On the next slide, you'll see the forecast for Vermont. So we do anticipate cases to continue to decrease through the month of February into March. Uh, you'll see that um, the forecast right now anticipates that they'll get down to about 200, maybe a little bit lower than that by the end of the month. So we still anticipate having you know, 100 or 200 cases a day maybe uh, that we'll see, but um, we do expect that improvement to continue and hopefully we'll get even lower than that throughout the month. And of course, we also fortunately expect the fatality rates to decrease as well, as you'll see on the next slide, uh, improving through the month of February uh, and into March. On the hospitalization front, both our admissions are currently hospitalized and our ICUs have all improved this week, consistent with improvements that we're seeing across New England. On the admissions front, we're down 14% over this past week. So that's an improvement that we've been seeing over the last two or three weeks. In terms of those that are currently hospitalized in Vermont, we're down about 13%. Uh, so continuing to see improvement in our hospitalizations, less pressure from COVID-19 on our hospitals, and our ICU numbers are down about 17% this week as well. So broad improvement uh, on all of those metrics, which is good to see. On the availability, as Secretary Samuelson mentioned, we're seeing less pressure from COVID. We're seeing stable uh, availability in terms of our general hospital beds 
and our ICU beds. You can see the numbers for today. 71 beds available uh, across the state, 15 ICU beds available. Uh, but the trend is improving availability uh, based on those leaving the hospital, in terms of the numbers of people having COVID leaving the hospital, I should say. In terms of fatalities, we are reporting now 558 fatalities for the entire pandemic, 13 deaths, unfortunately, for the month of February. But as I said, um, fortunately, we do anticipate those numbers will decrease this month and um, get to a much lower level, hopefully, over the next four to six weeks. Looking specifically at boosters, we wanted to highlight uh, some information that really um, reiterates things that we've been talking about here in Vermont uh, since boosters were widely available uh, to Vermonters. But three recent studies that the CDC has published or highlighted really show the effectiveness of the booster shot uh, for those that uh, get them to keep people out of the hospital, to keep them uh, not infected, and to keep their symptoms very low. So. These three studies, all supportive of Vermonters going out and getting their booster shot. The first one was out of 80,000 hospitalizations across the country, found that the booster was effective 90% of the time to keep people out of the hospital. So um, really effective in terms of improved hospitalization outcomes, 82% effective against uh, emergency room or urgent care visits. So again, highly effective in terms of keeping people out of the hospital. Also, the rates between people who were not vaccinated and those who were boosted, about five times different. So those who were not fully vaccinated, about five times greater case rates compared to those who were boosted. So again, showing improvement uh, in terms of preventing infection as well. And then in terms of symptomatic uh, infection, uh, even if you do get the infection, 67% uh, of those who were boosted uh, did not result in a symptomatic infection. So. Again, the, the evidence is very clear from the literature. We see it from the national data, and we're seeing it from our own Vermont data, as you'll see on the next slide. These are the graphs that we've been continually showing, but uh, eight times difference between those who are not fully vaccinated and those who are fully vaccinated and boosted in terms of hospitalizations over the last six weeks in Vermont. So a pretty stark difference there. And then in terms of fatalities, you see the 10 times difference for those who are not fully vaccinated compared to those who are fully vaccinated and boosted. So the data is very clear in our state. It's backed up by uh, academic literature and a scientific review across the country that getting your booster will mean much less likelihood of getting an infection in the first place. And even if you do get an infection, much less likelihood of hospitalization or death. And as you can see from the vaccine scorecard, Vermont continues to do very well across the board particularly well on the booster shots as well, being at or near the top of the country in terms of the rankings. Uh, and some new data that we're showing this week for the first time, those 12 to 17 uh, per the CDC, Vermont at 33.5% uh, of those eligible who have gotten their booster shot outpacing by quite a bit the rest of the country. So Vermont doing a good job in, in getting booster shots. Um, and as you'll see on the last slide here, about 3,500 Vermonters got their shot this past week. Uh, so that is certainly good news, but you can see that declining number there uh, over the last three or four weeks. We still anticipate over 150,000 Vermonters are eligible for their booster shot, but have not yet gotten it. You can see that the evidence, the data is very clear, uh, both to put the Omicron wave behind us and to be prepared for whatever COVID might throw at us next, critical to get your booster shot uh, to get the full protection of the vaccine. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, I will also speak to the booster theme. So as the Omicron surge continues to subside, we still have plenty of reason to look ahead to the future of COVID with hope. Now, we talk a lot about vaccination being the most powerful public health tool we have in the pandemic. Remember that just a year ago, many of us had little to no defense against the virus and were still eagerly awaiting our turn for vaccination. Since then, the virus has changed, but so has our ability to respond. And the power of vaccines is still strong, improving our chances against the worst outcomes of COVID as you saw once again on the slides. We've learned a lot in the past two years about this evolving virus and virus protection. So to be clear, 
We now know that your immunity decreases over time. And for this tool to really work, for you to be as protected as possible, being vaccinated means being up to date with your booster shot. For most people 12 and up, that means you need a three-dose series for full protection. The real-time data collected during the ongoing pandemic clearly shows higher protection against severe illness, hospitalization, and death with this third dose, the booster shot. Getting your booster is especially important for Vermonters who are old or otherwise at higher risk. But boosters also have an impact across all ages and health status, reducing your chance of spreading it to people at higher risk of a serious outcome. Our high vaccination rates and nation leading rate of 64% of people being up to date with all recommended doses of vaccine have helped keep Vermonters protected and out of the hospital, including residents of long-term care facilities. I do credit our high vaccination rates with putting our state in a position to better weather the Omicron surge. But this isn't just about getting through Omicron. It is about better positioning all of us to meet whatever the virus might present us with in the near or not distant or, or distant future. In Vermont, so many people have stepped up so quickly to get vaccinated to protect themselves in their community. Let's see if we can recapture that enthusiasm for getting the next level of protection from a booster shot. Now, I don't believe skepticism is the reason that Vermonters who have not yet gotten this additional dose have still not gotten it. It's more likely issues of time or not prioritizing or inconvenience. Well, we still have vaccine clinics available around the state, most with walk-in availability. And we continue working with businesses and event planners to make getting boosted easy and convenient. So if you've gotten your booster, help spread the word to friends and family. And if you haven't yet gotten yours, find a time and place that works for you. You can start at healthvermontgov slash myvaccine or call your provider. About 64% of primary care providers in Vermont are administering vaccines, which is a great opportunity for patients to get their shot right then and there. Clinicians and healthcare providers can also help by talking about getting vaccinated and boosted as part of their regular interactions with patients. And Vermonters can seek them out as a trusted resource for any questions or concerns. The healthcare system has been and will continue to be a huge key to our vaccination success. And I thank every member of our healthcare system. You are among the heroes of our pandemic response. To close out and sum up, the amount of virus in our communities may be going down, but Omicron is still here and still very contagious. Now is the time to get that needed protection. We know the virus is not going away, but vaccines and boosters can help keep it less of a threat to us all. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Sorry, the folks in the room. Governor Scott, as governors along the East Coast, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, move to end indoor mask mandates in schools and other indoor settings, where do we stand in Vermont? Any plans to follow suit? Um, you can add to that list uh, California and Oregon. Um, it seems like a um, somewhat of a consolidated effort by many Democrat governors across the country. Uh, to make this shift. Um, as you probably know, and we've talked about this a lot, we've extended our mask guidance uh, for schools a number of times, about every 30 days or so. Uh, the 28th of February is when we're scheduled to, to identify whether we're going to make that change or not, um, and we're contemplating that. Uh, and I, you know, the sooner we can get people, uh, kids in particular, uh, back to normal, and that's without masks, the better. Um, I reflect on, uh, I was talking to a, a, a mom uh, a week or two ago, 
and she was telling me about her two young daughters. Um, they'd never been to school. Uh, they started school um, as, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, they'd never been to school without a mask on. And one of her daughters came home last week or the week before and said to her mom, you know, mom, I don't mind wearing the mask, but I, uh, I don't know what my friends look like. And I thought, how sad is that? That they've been in school now for two years and they don't know what their, their, their classmates look like or their expressions on their face. And it's, uh, so, it's a big part of this social interaction. And uh, so I, I, if the numbers continue, we'll have this discussion. We'll make these decisions just like we have throughout the entire pandemic as a team. We'll listen to the experts, uh, our own experts, and determine the path forward. But, uh, but you know, it is interesting uh, that the states, we have, as uh, Commissioner Pichak had said, we have one of the highest vaccination rates in the country amongst kids uh, by far. And uh, when you look at it, that compared to, let's say, Oregon, I think we're at 75%, something like that. Uh, when you look at Oregon, I think they're 50%. So if they think it's safe, we are more prepared than any other state in the country to do this, to make this move. So we'll take all that in and uh, we'll try and give you uh, information on that just as soon as we possibly can. I think it, it's also important to note that many of these states, it's not instantaneous. They're looking end of February, first part of March. So they're just giving that foreshadowing. Governor, I, I know we've talked about this before, and I guess in the context of, of boosters and how you see them playing out in the long term. You know, we want people to get boosters now, but I mean, is this something that we that you see happening every year? You know, it's it's just like it's COVID. COVID. Yeah, it's COVID. Yeah, it's easy it's, to take a booster. Yeah, I, I think it's going. We're moving. We're evolving from pandemic and, and to endemic right before our eyes. And uh, just like with the flu, um, there's going to be different variants. We're going to have to, I believe, probably have uh, vaccinations uh, on a regular basis after that. But I'll, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that question. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Keep in mind, even though we're calling the third shot a booster, it's got a life of its own. It really should have been regarded as a three-shot series to get people's immune status up to speed uh, with something we'd never vaccinated anybody against before, and people didn't really even know timelines and what have you. Now, in retrospect, and as uh, science is honing this down further, it looks like maybe the second shot should have been eight weeks after and not three or four weeks after. And then the third could have come at another interval after that. But of course, during a pandemic, it's an emergency response and things happen as they have to happen. And I think the entire country uh, responded the right way in this effort. What we don't know in the future, because we don't have rapidly accessible tests to establish this that are clinically useful and practical, are testing of these memory cells that we have, B cells and T cells, and the whole side of immunity that has nothing to do with the antibody level in your blood has to do with these memory cells and especially the T cell side of immunity. Uh, as we get more sophisticated in being able to measure that and understand that, we will understand more about what's needed next in the future in combination with whatever the virus throws us in terms of if there is a new variant strain that has particular characteristics that make the current vaccines not as effective, uh, things will be designed. But most people are kind of resigned to the fact that this may be a yearly event, but there's no 100% uh, certainty about that right now. off-topic question. It looks like this week the House is taking up uh, potentially medical monitoring if some lawmakers get their way, um, third time's a charm. What will happen? Do you, what do you, do you make of the, the latest medical monitoring? First of all, Calvin, it's not off-topic. It is a topic uh, for our weekly press briefings at this point in time. We're evolving as well. So um, that, that bill in particular, as you know, I've uh, vetoed that before. 
uh, but it's come a long ways. Um, and uh, they've made uh, a number of improvements that make it much more palatable. So I don't know all the details of it, but, uh, but again, it looks much better uh, than the bills previously uh, on my desk. And uh, rental registry, I know that's uh, in the cards as well. You detailed that yeah. expressing concerns about the mom and pop. I, I still have concerns about that, and I've been vocal with the Senate in particular uh, about that. We've been having some discussions and, uh, and ways, to, they've improved it some, but not as far as I'd like them to go. Um, but we're in discussions with them right now. Um, we'll, we'll see whether they take any of the uh, proposals that I've uh, put forth to them and put it in the bill. And uh, if they do, then maybe we'll have something we can work with. But if not, it may face the same demise. We'll, we'll see. Governor, you spoke a little bit before about kind of the challenges that this pandemic has, you know, created, you know, unprecedented challenges for even students, you know, some students not even seeing, you know, other students, you know, faces. And I guess if you can speak a little more about, you know, the mental health challenge of it, you know, with students and schools and teachers and maybe a message that you have for parents um, on how to help with students that are going through mental health due to the pandemic. Yeah, we've known for quite some time. I, I mean, we, we identified this months ago um, that our kids aren't okay, right? And uh, that's why we worked so hard, oh, I think it was uh, a year ago, to get them back into school. I mean, that was important to us because we knew that they were better in school than out of school, regardless of the, whether they were wearing a mask or not. It was important to get them uh, to in-person instruction. Um, so we're, uh, we're well aware of this. We have, uh, there's a lot of federal money that's been included that's going directly to schools for just this purpose. Um, but, uh, but the sooner we can get them back to anything that resembles normal, the better off the kids are going to be. And that's what we're working towards. Uh, Secretary French, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I've just been reflecting a bit on uh, particularly this moment and the question about masking and that transition that we're in. As the governor mentioned, I think, you know, the planning on and certainly acknowledging that mental health is a key uh, issue has to be addressed. But I think right now in the next month or so, um, I've been thinking a lot about just lowering the anxiety level that's in our schools. And, and that pertains to, I think, to a certain extent, how we view the virus and our relationship to it. It's to a certain extent, we've been on a roller coaster ride with the virus and certain things we haven't been able to control, but we do control how we perceive it. And um, we convey uh, anxiety to children. So what we need to do in schools right now in particular is really focus internally in individual schools and across the system on lowering that anxiety level. And that's, that's really part of what getting back to normal for me means. Uh, you know, so there's routines inside a school, whether it be in the cafeteria and the arts and so forth, those activities should start looking more normal for students and we should just take that pressure off them. Um, and I think it's, it's a great opportunity to try to emphasize those things at the local level. Thank you. Secretary can I ask along those lines, um, with teacher burnout, do you think things along those lines would help prevent that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, they're, um, you know, it's, it's a complex topic. You know, we can certainly talk more broadly about workforce issues and education is not isolated from that. Uh, but we have set schools up and this is sort of an, an, an unfortunate after effect of our mitigation success. We've set schools up to be sort of isolated and protected and that tension is not sustainable and particularly as we start coming out the other side of that. And Every single day, our teachers are in the classroom trying to make students feel normal, and that, that's, hard, that's a hard load to bear, particularly when uh, we have staff absenteeism as, as a parent in other sectors of the economy. So yes, I think it's important that we really kind of collectively work on our, our attitudes towards uh, the virus and really do our best to sort of acknowledge we've been through a heck of a journey here. And it's a pretty amazing accomplishment that we've been able to keep our schools open throughout some of the more difficult moments of the pandemic. Uh, which every every educator should be tremendously proud about. Uh, but now we should work equally hard to sort of lower the tension in our buildings and really uh, get back to the joy of teaching and learning. All right, we'll switch on over to the phones, starting with Lisa Rathke, the Associated Press. Hi, thanks, Jason. Um, booster, uh, uh, 
You know, I'm sure Verona's roughly have not gotten that third check. No, I, I see the percentages, but do we know the number? We, we got part of that, Lisa, but I think your question is for Commissioner Pichek, how many, how many have not received the booster? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so Lisa, we, we know that there are about 440,000 people that are fully vaccinated in Vermont, give or take, and just under 300,000 that, um, that have received their booster. So, you know, some people are not quite yet eligible for the booster. So it's somewhere between that 100 and 140,000, somewhere in that range. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay. And then, Governor, I was wondering if you um, have any comment about the debate that's going on in Burlington over the next police chief. Um, you know that the mayor had wanted to promote the acting chief, John Murad, and uh, the city council rejected that. Um, do you have, and they've been without a police chief for two years now, a permanent one. Uh, do you have any comment about what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, it's concerning, uh, obviously, for law enforcement in general throughout the state with all they've had to go through um, in terms of different training and, and some of the public pressure on them. Um, so getting back uh, to some sort of uh, semblance of normal is uh, good for Burlington as well. Um, I, I would just say, and without getting into the particulars about who makes what decisions in what communities, I do think um, a leader, uh, the mayor, or the governor, or whoever it is, uh, should be able to surround themselves with the people they want. Uh, and, uh, and I look at my team, and, and I've handpicked my team based on those four C's I've talked about a lot. Um, but, uh, but I need the right chemistry uh, for it to work for me so I can deliver the best product uh, to Vermonters. Um, but if I'm hampered by uh, a body uh, that, uh, that prevents me from doing that, it makes my job that much harder. And uh, they have to, uh, we have to have trust in our leaders. They are elected to, to lead and to form teams uh, that deliver the services that uh, their constituency expects. Okay, thank you. Anna Van Dyne, VPR. Hi, yeah, I have a question for Secretary French. Um, Secretary French, you talked about the importance of vaccination for schools um, and for kids, but there are still really stark disparities in vaccination rates around the state. Um, I'm thinking about like in Essex County, only 26% of kids 5 to 11 are vaccinated, while in Chittenden County, that number is 77%. Um, and last week you said that the state needs to be able to provide support to school districts with lower student vaccination rates. Um, but you said at that point you weren't sure what that would look like. Do you have any more clarity on what that might look like? Yeah, thank you. The, the first part of the question, um, it's just getting a little more accurate on the data. Uh, it's taking a little longer than I hope, but uh, our team at the AOE is working closely with the team at the Agency of Human Services to kind of put those data together. Uh, so what we need to do is focus in on literally on a school by school basis. So, um, you know, I think, and then once we have that information and certainly coming out of Omicron, it's a little easier to think about, uh, but we have, you know, the same tools we've always had in our toolkit, whether they be testing, um, or additional support in terms of helping schools uh, navigate mitigation strategies and so forth. Um, we would be putting together some sort of portfolio of resources, but I think if, if the broader context of our schools, uh, the simmer comes down off the pot, so to speak, it's gonna allow us to, to deploy our state resources in a more focused way on specific ecosystems and school districts. Would that mean something like additional school-based vaccination clinics in those areas where vaccination rates are lower? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I used an example a couple times during the pandemic. Uh, our team worked directly with the Barry City School District as an ecosystem, if you will. Um, and I, I went out with our team at one point for a site visit just to understand some of the dynamics. And they have, in, every community is, is a little different in Vermont in that regard. So we have to understand what does it take to get to that last mile of getting vaccination out? Where do, where do people live? 
Uh, do you have homeless communities and, and motels, for example? Do we need to, to do that sort of last mile effort? Is it communication? Is it transportation? Whatever it is, uh, there's a lot of local expertise in those districts, and we need to come in, I think, in a more focused way uh, to support that. It's been challenging to do because we've had to uh, supervise the entire state across the board. But I think, you know, ultimately that's with a more precise understanding of the trends, uh, it'll allow us to come in in a more focused way uh, to support those communities that need, need additional support. All right, thank you. I, mean, I just might also add that we had this in mind um, before Delta, actually. When the kids were coming back to school, we had had an 80% threshold if you had 80% vaccinated in schools uh, that you wouldn't have to wear a mask and there would be a financial benefit to doing that. And uh, so we put that on hold uh, throughout Delta and then uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen with Omicron. Um, but, um, but that's still, you know, another tool we have and something that we'll be talking about and considering whether we continue with that or we do something different. But, um, but just as a reminder, we, we were trying to find opportunities as well as with testing and, and making sure that we had vaccines available for the schools. Uh, that we provided some other carrot for them to uh, to attain that level. All right, we'll move to Aaron Patanko, VT Digger. Hi. Um, you know, as you as you kind of contemplate dropping the mask mandate in schools, you know, you could kind of put out a mask recommendation, an indoor mask recommendation for Vermonters way back in November and haven't really said much during the Omicron wave um, and in recent weeks about whether you think that Vermonters should be wearing a mask indoors. Do you still stand by that indoor mask recommendation or do you think it's safe for Vermonters to remove the mask? Yeah, I might, uh, I might clarify that throughout since we made that decision we, week in and week out, we've been talking about the importance of wearing a mask when in congregate settings and where there's people around and indoors in particular. So uh, that w it still uh, has been a good idea. Now, there's, there's, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about just that uh, with the hospitalizations. Uh, we haven't, we've said we weren't going to, to watch the case numbers. It's really about the hospitalizations uh, at this point in time. Uh, and that's the metric uh, that we're, we're, again, watching to see it receding, uh, which is good news. Uh, so we'll, we'll put that in the mix, uh, obviously. If we're uh, telling uh, kids it's okay uh, to go into settings without masks, then uh, we'd be saying, you know, the same thing for other, uh, other areas as well. Now, that could be complicated by uh, some of the massing requirements that we gave um, to municipalities uh, to have their own uh, mass mandate. Um, so we'll have to, again, we'll have to work our way through that. But just so everyone's aware, I mean, we've only provided, we don't have any <coughs> mandates as a state. Uh, we, uh, we provided guidance to schools and uh, most of them, 99% of them, except for maybe Canaan, uh, have, uh, have adopted that. So will provide more guidance by, by the 28th, and uh, it's up to them whether they want to follow that or not. Okay, thank you. Um, Governor, I also, I know this happened, you know, very recently. Uh, you may not have heard Proposal 5 actually just passed. Um, you know, Vermont House approved it, sending it to the voters. Do you have any thoughts to share on that passage of Proposal 5? Yeah, I've been supportive of that, and... Uh, Again, I think it's uh, it'll get through the through the house, and then it'll go to the voters at that point, and they'll make the decision from there. But uh, but I've been supportive of that. Okay, thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Thanks, Jason. This is a quick question for Commissioner Pichak. During your presentation, you said that 60% of those 
who are boosted did not have symptomatic COVID infection. How were those specific cases diagnosed? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I was referring to one of the academic studies that was uh, conducted. It looked at 13,000 infections uh, that occurred with Omicron and then made a determination about uh, individuals' vaccination status, so were they boosted, fully vaccinated, not fully vaccinated, uh, and then looked at uh, whether or not they reported symptomatic infections. So if they were infected, did they have a symptomatic infection? Um, and it was, I think, 76% uh, of those who were boosted did not have a, a symptomatic infection. I think it was 66% of those who were fully vac vaccinated that did not have a symptomatic uh, infection as well. So they were looking at that sort of controlled group of 13,000 uh, individuals with Omicron uh, and based it on their vaccination status. So is it safe to assume those were PCR? That was PCR testing done in a medical Yeah, I think, I think they would have been confirmed. I mean, they would have been confirmed cases. I mean, I can't remember from the study if it was antigen or PCR that they used, but I would assume it was PCR. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, thanks. Uh, on the topic of boosters, um, it doesn't seem like our numbers really are budging that much over the last handful of weeks. And I'm curious, Dr. Levine, I believe you had said you would like to see us get up to around 90%. And um, at what point do you start to have some concern that we're just not going to get there? And does that complicate our transition into the living with the virus phase? Um, do you talk a little bit about that? Sure. <clears throat> I mean, the fact of the matter is, though we have less people stepping up to the plate every week, we have people stepping up to the plate every week, and that's really important. Um, <clears throat> and it's been through the entire Omicron We've gone to higher numbers than we have now, but still, uh, we're, we're making progress every time. Um, <clears throat> clearly, you know, when you look at the nation's progress, it's been quite slow in this regard as well. So there's been a feeling of a lack of sense of urgency that most people have had, even when Omicron was uh, at its worst. So um, there's only so much arm twisting one can do. But I do think one of the reasons we have one of the highest rates is because we have made access a non-issue. <clears throat> Everyone has access in a convenient and sometimes very timely way. Many, many states are not actually actively involved themselves in the ability of a citizen to get uh, vaccinated. We have remained involved for the entire pandemic and are just as involved now as previously. So I think knowing that there are clinics, knowing there are opportunities, um, will continue to be the strategy. Um, and now that things are getting even further integrated into the healthcare system, particularly the doctors that people go to for their routine care, uh, there's always going to be opportunities there because as one of those doctors, when you see a patient, you address the issue that they're there for, you may address some of their ongoing chronic issues, but you also address what we term health maintenance, which may be are they up to date on screening for a mammogram or what have you? Are they up to date on their immunizations, which now includes COVID? So I see abundant opportunities. The second part of your question was um, if it may interfere with uh, the progress sort of that we would like to make moving forward. And I, I can't say that the state with the best booster rate would have uh, this rate, even though it's not at 90 percent, uh, interfere seriously with our ability to move forward. Uh, but I do, again, want to reiterate what I said in my comments, which was we're not just here to take care of Omicron with the booster and make your outcome, if you got Omicron, the best outcome possible and not a serious outcome. We're also thinking towards a future of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and will it come back in another surge with another variant or what have you? Because what we've seen is that that nice expanded immunity that vaccination provides, whether you had a previous infection or not, 
uh, is really going to be fundamental to how we can respond as a whole state to whatever comes next. Hoping nothing comes next, but at the same time being realistic. Great. And then just one question for the governor. Um, you had mentioned um, the moves by some other states to lift their mask mandates. And I was just curious, do you think that they are moving too quickly? Or do you think that this is sort of every state needs to make its own decision here? Yeah, I think every state needs to make their own decision. Obviously, uh, they're feeling uh, pressure in their states uh, from their constituencies. Uh, otherwise, they may not be making this decision so quickly. It seemed like all of a sudden. That's why I was wondering if it was a coordinated effort of some sort. But, um, but we are seeing this uh, receding uh, case numbers, hospitalizations are down uh, throughout the country. Uh, so this is real, and, uh, and we are benefiting from that uh, as well here in Vermont. And as I said before, if any state can do it, it's us because we have uh, some of the highest vaccination rates, booster rates uh, in the country. So uh, we'll see what happens in the next week or two. Thanks. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Tom Davis. All right, we'll move to Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Uh, the CDC website seems silent in this subject, so I'll ask you. Uh, have there been any vaccine reaction deaths to the Pfizer vaccine, either in Vermont or the U.S.? Yeah, you cut out there right at the end, uh, Guy, but I think you wondered if there was any deaths due to reactions to the Pfizer or maybe any of the vaccinations? Well, I, I, you, thank you for asking. I, I did mean specifically the Pfizer vaccine, uh, either, in the, either in Vermont or the U.S. I, I'm not aware of any in Vermont. I don't know about the U.S. I'll ask uh, Dr. Levine if he has any knowledge of that. No, I'm not aware of any in Vermont. Uh, I'm hesitant to speak to the whole country because I'm, I'm not sure. So I'm not going to give a potentially incorrect answer. Thank you. Um, this morning, uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Levine and Secretary French spoke at a Vermont Immunization Advisory Council meeting in which I quote, the, the meeting notice was, uh, quote, the question of requiring COVID-19 vaccination of preschool and school-age children is expected to be discussed. And so I'm wondering why with COVID-19 apparently causing so little harm to school-age children and with COVID on the way, is this state advisory body considering requi requiring vaccination? I think we have to um, meet, don't we? Uh, Dr. Levine, I think it's just a, it's a scheduled meeting, but I'll let Dr. Levine and Secretary French answer for themselves. This, this is a statute mandated body and meeting tempo. So it needed to have a meeting. It needed to be reorganized because it had been some time since previous meeting. Um, there are one or two members that need to be added because of the fact that uh, others had retired. And uh, the, the body is meant to be just what it says, advisory regarding uh, vaccinations in the school age population. So um, that means there'll be a need to review on a broader scale uh, the performance in Vermont of vaccines with regard to uh, percentages of students who have met the requirements uh, for attending school with the vaccine schedule. The topic of a mandated COVID vaccine is an important one for the body to uh, 
become informed about and potentially advise uh, the Commissioner of Health and others regarding. Uh, I do not regard, in keeping with the tone of your question, I do not regard it to be an urgent matter since so many of the students and children have become just eligible to get vaccinated. We are by far leading the nation in the effort to get them vaccinated and the percentage that are already vaccinated. So though it needs to be discussed over time, it's certainly not an urgent matter at this point in time. So is this, are we looking at possibly a discussion of it, like an annual required school vaccine for COVID-19? That, that would be the question on the table. Where do you, what do you think about that? Oh, at the present, I don't feel it's something that we need to think about, as I said, today. Um, but there are a lot of things we need to sort of integrate into our thinking regarding what, why this should or should not happen. A lot of it has to do with uh, how the vaccine performs in that age population. A lot of it has to do with how the disease uh, functions in that age population. Some of it has to do with Vermont specific data about how the uptake of the vaccine has been and what the outcomes have been regarding uh, illness in that population who has been vaccinated versus not been vaccinated. So there's a lot of things to, to sort of put on the table. Um, and this is a very early juncture I would regard. Not the least of which is, of course, these vaccines are just for many of the youngest children just becoming uh, available and, uh, for them. And uh, some are still under emergency use authorization and uh, haven't yet achieved the approval for the, uh, that the older population recently achieved for both Moderna and Pfizer. Okay. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I have a question about the wireless proposal you have. But first, I was wondering, you know, looking at the numbers, the COVID numbers uh, recently, the number of fatalities is still relatively high, even though the number of hospitalizations are going down. I was wondering what the, the profile of these um, uh, people who are dying from COVID is, and are they dying outside of the sort of the hospital or the emergency structure, the healthcare structure? I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Levine clarify anything I'm about to say, but uh, it's a mixture of, of both. Um, I would say mostly elderly uh, with um, compromised health conditions that uh, have, uh, have added uh, to their vulnerability, I would say, uh, to COVID. So it's unfortunate. I, I also would say many of the deaths are, are related to um, the Delta variant as well. It's still a hangover from the Delta variant and not, uh, maybe not, I, I, again, I don't have anything to, to base this on other than uh, the length of stay in the hospital and, and the high level of uh, Delta we had uh, going through December. Uh, but a lot of this is still um, related to, to that Delta variant. And I would agree with that. Um, we, we've done an analysis looking at when people uh, first entered the hospital and many people who do succumb to this uh, often have a very long hospital stay uh, prior to eventually dying. And the length of that stay would indicate that they most likely acquired the Delta variant originally. More recently though, of course, uh, with Omicron at such high numbers, one of the things we were very concerned about with these high numbers are even if it's less lethal virus than Delta was, just the fact you have that sheer number of cases will lead to more people having some of these serious outcomes, even if the rate of those serious outcomes is lower than it was with Delta, um, just a population-wide statistic. We are indeed seeing um, many, many people who are very late in life who have a lot of other uh, chronic medical conditions. Um, and I've often compared that to other respiratory viruses this time of year where the same phenomenon occurs. 
Um, we do see, and I, I, I'm only saying this because it stands out in my mind every time I see the list of people who have died from COVID, there are a select group of people who really have um, of varying ages, but mostly in the middle and older ages, who have chosen not to be vaccinated, whose only diagnosis on their death certificate is that they had a COVID-related death, related usually to all of the complications of COVID that you might uh, think possible, whether that be respiratory failure, pneumonia, um, <clears throat> other blood clotting abnormalities related to COVID, et cetera. Um, so to me, those are deaths that are potentially avoidable, especially because it doesn't appear that the person was that uh, ill in any other way. We'll have, uh, obviously, <clears throat> reports on this. We usually accumulate you know, a, a number of cases and then um, develop a report. So we'll be able to report on this at a later time. All right, great, thank you. As for the, the wireless bill, Governor, um, is it, I'm wondering two things. One about the, the timeline of when uh, people, say in Orange County, might expect better cell service. And also, is 100 towers enough to get this job done? I'm gonna let Commissioner Tierney uh, answer the second part. The first part, I'll start by saying it, it really depends on the legislature at this point. Uh, it's hard to give a timeline when we don't know if they're going to agree with the provision of uh, this vision of, of providing more cell service for Vermonters in some of these areas that have none. So uh, it's somewhat in their hands and uh, we'll see how they react to this. I haven't heard a lot from them at this point in time, uh, but, um, but hopefully uh, they'll see the merits in, in uh, doing so. I, I would assume um, some of your businesses would would benefit from this as well, Tim. Thank you. As for the question about whether 100 towers is enough to get to the, the job done, uh, it's a very good question and safe side caution suggests that we not be over uh, optimistic or hasty in saying as much. What I can say is that 100 cell towers will significantly improve the state of coverage in Vermont, and they will be thoughtfully chosen as to maximize the impact. As with all innovations, uh, success begets success. So to the extent that there are pockets left or other gaps, if you will, that are not resolved with these 100 towers, when we have the success of 100 Towers under our belts and it's visible, then we can have a serious discussion about completing the job if it isn't already complete. But the first thing we have to do is make up our minds that this is the direction we want to go, that we want to invest historic one-time funding in such an endeavor, and that we want to move off the mark because our conversation about cell service coverage in Vermont has been stymied for a very long time by different positions and mostly though, above all, lack of funding and the unwillingness to recognize that when there are market gaps, you have to do something about it and it's not always going to be prevailing on industry to do it for themselves. If there's no business case, they're not going to. But if we can partner with them and provide some form of subsidy, which is exactly what this proposal is, we can get that job done, and then we can see it through to completion if this does not prove to be enough. Does that answer your question? Yes, I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, June, if there's been any um, pushback on this, because there's not a single Vermonter who wouldn't agree that we need better cell service. I think that's fascinating. I agree with you completely. The data in my department and my experience with the issue clearly shows folks want cell service to be ubiquitous and reliable. And there have been some re reactions I've had though that have suggested that some folks who are in leadership are not quite off, ready to, to move off the mark. I think they can get there if they understand that Vermonters really want this. There are uglies about it, I'll be candid, but this on balance is the best way forward in my judgment. 
All right, great. Thank you very much. Joseph Bresser, yeah. Martin Chronicle. Let me just add uh, to oh, sorry, Joe. just to Tim. Um, again, I just want to stress this is a another one of those once in a lifetime opportunities, truly transformative. Something that we won't. I don't know when we'll have another fifty million dollars uh, that would. Uh, uh, be earmarked for this very purpose. So uh, this was uh, clear in the in the uh, federal legislation uh, that this was for communication, for broadband, for cell service, and so forth. So this fits fits the bill, and uh, we want to make sure that Vermonters know about this. And if they have uh, any thoughts on it, they should uh, contact their legislator and let them be known. Great, thank you. Joseph, Martin Chronicle. All right, we'll try Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you, good afternoon. Um, <laughs> Governor, you may recall in early December, I asked you about an incident in which an alleged uh, serial vandal had damaged dozens of cars in St. Johnsbury. Um, after a, a couple months of legal proceedings uh, and another mental health evaluation that suggests the individual is incompetent, his um, bail was reduced. He was released a few days ago, and, and you may have seen the headlines. Uh, less than a day later, he turned up in Montpelier and was arrested again. Um, this time he's accused of damaging parked cars, throwing things like rocks at pedestrians, um, banging on the door and vandalizing the porch of a wheelchair-bound 80-year-old woman and intimidating a pregnant woman and her three-year-old as they tried to leave their home to go for a walk, um, as well as uh, assaulting a responding police officer on um, all the allegations uh, in Montpelier from the other day. Um, to many, this seems like systemic indifference to the safety of Vermonters and the needs of this individual. Does Vermont really lack the legal authority to protect its citizens and the ability or resources to care for this man? Yeah, I saw that uh, in the news this morning as well. And uh, I thought about what you uh, said back in December and what we've seen uh, throughout Vermont from the same individual. And there's clearly a hole in the system that needs to be filled. And uh, so we'll be work working on that. Um, I haven't had an opportunity uh, since uh, learned of this this morning uh, to talk with our legal counsel uh, as well as with um, Commissioner Sherling uh, about what's the remedy? What, what, what can we do to protect Vermonters? Uh, because it clearly is uh, repetitive. So I agree. We have, we have a problem that needs to be fixed. Uh, can Secretary Samuelson perhaps speak to the forensic working group? It, uh, I'm not 100% sure what they're up to, but it seems like they're uh, nibbling in this field. Secretary Samuelson. So the forensic, you are correct. The forensic working group has um, been looking at um, the system for forensic care. Um, I think as they've moved forward, there's been a lot more questions than there have been answers. But I think what they've done is really hone in on um, some key areas of focus. That said, as we move forward, we really do uh, recognize that um, this, is a, this is a serious um, component of the care and services that we should be evaluating and looking at in Vermont. And we look at partnering, look forward to partnering with the governor and partnering with, um, with the legislature on, on really evaluating what our next steps are here. Is there a fundamental need? I mean, is it a facility? Is it the legal authority? I mean, where, where, how many cracks are there, and and how do you fill them? Yeah, I think I would turn to uh, to, to some of the questions that are in the most recent um, report from the forensic work group. I can't get into all of the details um, here. Um, I do know that what we're committed to in Vermont um, in the mental health system of care is really working with individuals to provide treatment and support. Um, but there is a gap in forensic, in our forensic system um, that we uh, look at trying to address, but we do need to um, be thoughtful and careful as we move forward, uh, making sure to um, address both the protection of um, our communities, but also the rights of individuals um, and their need for treatment. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and if I may, uh, on the cell uh, tower proposal for Commissioner Tierney, um, you cited the drive study uh, and at least an initial proposal for uh, 100 cell towers. Wondering um, how many uh, of the underserved miles uh, are in the Northeast Kingdom and how many of those towers potentially could be cited in the kingdom? So those are really good questions, thank you. Uh, if I could ask you to contact my office, Director Clay Purvis, we can get you very precise information about that. But um, as we stand here right now, part of the analysis is about taking a completely fresh look and finding those optimal sites. So we can give you an idea, but I don't think we can tell you exactly how many roads are in the Northeast Kingdom and how many of those towers would be there. Safe to say, quite a few. Andrew, okay, thanks, I'll reach out. Andrew, I can send you an email and copy Clay to connect you right after the press conference. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Mike, True North Reports. Mike, you'll have to hit star six. Hi, I'm here. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Hello? go ahead, Mike. Okay, no, sorry about that. Uh, all right, so my question is, uh, Pfizer just submitted an emergency use authorization application for children six months to four years old. They are planning two shots for this age group. However, CNN reported the child shots failed in the clinical trials. What is Vermont going to do about shots for this age group? If the news were as dire as you just presented, we won't have to make a decision because they won't be authorized by the FDA or CDC. Uh, so mm -hmm. my understanding is that in spite of the, I'll put it in quotes, failure uh, in that age group two to four, uh, they were encouraged to seek emergency use authorization. So that means there's something in the data that we just don't have any eyes on at this point in time because that data has not been publicly released for anybody to uh, analyze and it's going to the FDA. So Vermont never makes these decisions in a vacuum and the bottom line is the whole process has to be gone through beginning with the advisory panel to the FDA recommending the FDA give it emergency use authorization then that would happen if the FDA uh, went by the advice they were getting. Then the <laughs> Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is the CDC's advisory panel, would review the data again and make a recommendation to the director of the CDC. So only when all of those hoops had been gone through and all the check marks in the boxes happened would uh, we even be able to think about what we would do. Um, so we'll go with the best science possible, which means we'll be able to see the science and data as well, and we'll go with the guideline recommendations that these august bodies put out. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that they're already allowing us to pre-order vaccine for this age group, just so if it does look like it is a very sound decision to be made, and it would be very helpful to that age population, we would already be poised prior to the decision to uh, have the vaccine in the state and begin that process. Um, okay, well, th thank you. All right, that's it. All right, thank you very much, and we'll see you again next Tuesday.